Peter and I have known each other for a long time, and I'm very happy to be introducing him. He earned his BA degree in history, cum laude, uh, from Boston University in 1976, and a PhD in Egyptian archaeology from the University of Chicago in 1993. He has been teaching at American University in Cairo as the Simpson Visiting Professor of, Egyptian, of Egyptology, as well as at Syracuse and Albany and MIT. He is especially involved in museum work, and when he was a graduate student, he was a research assistant in the Field Museum of, of Natural History in Chicago, and an acting registrar in the Oriental Institute Museum, and then he went to the MFA in Boston as assistant curator of the ancient Egyptian, Nubian, and Near Eastern art. Uh, he was there for 16 plus years. He likes to stay a while. <laughs> and then he went to the Michael C. Carlos Museum in Albany, in Albany, in Atlanta, first as curator and then quickly as senior curator of ancient Egyptian, Nubian, and Near Eastern art for 16 plus years. <laughs> and then he retired. Well, sort of. And remember the time that he was at uh, the Carlos, he acquired the Niagara Falls Museum mummy collection and odd bits of uh, Egyptian artifacts in 1999. And remember that uh, he repatriated the mummy of Ramses I back to Egypt, uh, and uh, it's now in the Luxor Museum in 2003. And before his retirement, he arranged a long-term collection share agreement between the Carlos and the Houston Museum of Natural Science, including artifact, artifact conservation. He is now the director and founder, as of 2014, of the Ancient Egyptian Heritage and Archaeology Fund, which is a private nonprofit organization based in Albany, whose mission is to support research on Egyptian history and culture with emphasis on protecting, conserving, recording, and publishing endangered sites. He, uh, of course, has done extensive field work at Daryl Velas, naturally, of which we're going to see today, at Abidos with Janet Richards, at Giza with Mark Lehner, in the Valley of the Kings with Nick Reeves. Uh, at Hierakopolis with Michael Hoffman, Gebel Sicily with Ricardo Caminas, and currently the Malkata Survey, which is a joint expedition between the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Ancient Egyptian Heritage and Archaeology Fund, uh, and the expedition is co-directed by Diana Patch. His major publication started when he was a child. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the little catalog, Mummies and Magic, the Funerary Arts of Ancient Egypt from the MFA, edited uh, uh, also by uh, Sue Doria and Catherine Roerig, <laughs> among, uh, along with numerous other exhibition catalogs when he was at the Carlos Museum. He has actually two significant RC publications. The first is the preliminary report on the Darrell Balas expedition for the 1980 to 86 seasons, and he also has an essay in, on Nubia in the American discovery of ancient Egypt. And of course, his uh, seminal the New Kingdom Royal City in Egypt. And finally, uh, as of uh, 2012, the uh, ancient Nubia, African Kingdoms of the Nile, edited with Margie Fisher, Salima Ikram, and Sudoria. And by the way, it was named the best book in the archaeology and anthropology category during the uh, 37th annual American Publishers Awards for professional and scholarly excellence. Mm -hmm. Oh. Now that <laughs> so I, I was put on Peter, uh, Peter's dissertation committee with Mark Lehner, so he's, he's had interesting things happen to him throughout his whole career. And the last two are, are really uh, personal memories. In the spring of 1982, uh, uh, when my wife Martha had, uh, was excavating uh, uh, was not excavating, but, but was studying pottery um, with the Egypt Exploration Society's Amarna expedition. Uh, Peter accompanied her um, uh, back to uh, Luxor. They traveled together by train. The train got stuck somewhere along the way, and a fellow passenger told them the train wasn't going any further south than Sohan, which doesn't uh, bring the bacon. Martha was worried that they might have to find a hotel for the night, but she was carrying, uh, but she was carrying with her only the historical 1929 edition of the Bedeker Handbook. <laughs> I had to think what those hotels would look like at this time. 
Nevertheless, they eventually arrived at Chicago House well after midnight, having sustained each other with snacks and a bottle of vanilla liqueur Jack, someone had given Peter. Then, when Peter was uh, working with, with Caminos at Gebel Sosilla, there was no cook. And everyone in the isolated camp had to eat what Ricardo did. That is, one third of a small can of tuna or mackerel per person per meal. On a diet like this, of course, Peter lost 20 pounds in two weeks. <laughs> I'd like to introduce now to you this phenomenon and let him tell you more stories. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. That was, it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you here. It's, oh, it's, we want you to talk to the, the, microphone. the microphone. OK. Yeah. Um, but I uh, worked at the site again as a graduate student, and it, it interested me, um, as I hope it will you. This is a reconstruction by uh, Fran Weatherhead and uh, Sebastian Gatt, uh, uh, and that shows the palace. And we'll, we'll come back and talk about this a little bit more. But uh, Daryl Boas is located uh, here. Uh, just at the curve, this what's called the Kennebec, just north of Luxor, about 30 kilometers north of Luxor. And here you can see it a little better. So this is uh, the Nile here uh, curves around right at the town, the large city of Kenna here. Uh, and the site is in uh, nestled in the hills right here, uh, where it forms a sort of a natural amphitheater. Um, that sort of shows off the site. You can see it here. These are the limestone cliffs uh, that recede back to, just as uh, at Tel El Amarna, it's sort of uh, the Egyptians use the landscape as kind of a, to showcase these sites, these uh, royal cities. So the site is nestled here between two small modern villages, Daryl Garbi. It's to the north of uh, the town of Balas here, uh, which is famous for um, these pottery vessels, uh, water vessels, and they're prized all over Egypt because the, the clay is particularly fine at Daryl Balas, so it lets uh, a little of the uh, liquid evaporate, so it, it naturally cools the water, so the water left in these, and it actually also imparts kind of a Swedish taste to it, so, um, so it's a big industry there. But the site itself, the ancient site, uh, was first uh, worked at uh, by George Andrew Reisner from 1900 to 1901. And he worked there with F.W. Green, who later went on to work at Hierakompolis, uh, and Albert M. Lithgow, who went on to found the department at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And Reisner was sponsored by Phoebe Hurst, uh, William Randolph's mother, uh, who was sort of fascinated with Egypt. And so she decided to hire this young American to work for uh, her, for the uh, University of California at Berkeley. Um, and so he began his expedition, and he set his sights on, the, on Giza, but he wanted to, as he said, try out some little sites beforehand. So he tried experimenting on uh, a number of sites in uh, Middle Egypt, uh, Daryl Blas included. Uh, and so this is some of the excavation there. He started, they built a small camp at the site, and they worked on and off uh, for about six months. Unfortunately, the material got back to Berkeley just in time for the San Francisco earthquake. Um, so all the pottery got smashed, but it did make it easier to draw. So, <laughs> so there's always a silver lining. But Reisner then left uh, Mrs. Hurst's employee and went to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. He made uh, many more great discoveries in both Egypt and in Nubia, and Daryl Bloss kind of got forgotten about until uh, I worked there as a, a, a young student and came upon the records of the site, and uh, during this time, people were starting to get interested in settlement archaeology, and it had been kind of long, long neglected in Egypt because people were much more interested in tombs and temples and things like that. So this was sort of forgotten. There was a little squib about the palaces that Reisner had found in uh, William Stevenson Smith's Art and Architecture of Ancient Egypt, but by and large it was pretty, pretty unknown. So I went back there with, a, with uh, thanks to several RC grants uh, in order to uh, survey the site and take, it, uh, take a look and then uh, published a preliminary report 
uh, from some of the several seasons, we had several seasons between 1980 and 1986. That actually, it has a very, even now, a very large uh, standing remains. This is the uh, main palace, the, the North Palace, that's in the center of the site. And this is Charlie Evers, who was our architect, planning the, the brickwork there. Uh, and it's quite a monumental structure. Even the bricks are monumental. The bricks are over half a meter long. So they're, they're huge bricks, uh, even for Egypt. And you see what he's standing on is a, a casemate foundation. Oops. Uh, and these are cells to build a sort of elevated second story. So the palace would have had that kind of tower-like impression, as you saw in the reconstruction drawing. Unfortunately, the sort of um, the upper level had then been converted into a Coptic church, which is why it's called Daryl Blas. And Reisner was sort of not interested in that, so he kind of shaved it off, but also shaved off the New Kingdom upper levels as well. So, so we were left. And then with the help of Mark Lehner, we surveyed the site because although there were isolated plans of the structures, they'd never been uh, put on a ground plan, so we didn't know where they were. They were just kind of floating in space, so we were able to eventually make a, a ground plan of the, the site, and it was very difficult. Catherine very will, will uh, sympathize, because she had to do this at uh, Malkata as well, but in many cases, the houses had uh, completely eroded, and so we only have faint traces of... Uh, the structures uh, uh, as Reisner had originally found them. In some cases, we actually were able to find them by the shape of the dumps around them. The houses had completely gone, but the, the pattern of the dumps of their excavation outlined where the house was and what, what shape it was. So we were ev eventually able to put together a map of the whole site. You can see it's a a really huge site. It, it stretches about five kilometers north to south, uh, again with this large palace in the center. And the palace itself is uh, over 900 feet long by uh, 450 feet wide. So a huge, huge structure. Uh, and then what really interested me was that there were lots of similarities to Tel El Amarna. There was a workman's village, chapels for the workmen, uh, an administrative quarter, uh, houses for the nobility, uh, as well as uh, the palace itself. And then on the southern part is a lar another large structure. It's about uh, 100 feet by uh, uh, 60 feet wide. Uh, and it's actually a tower-like structure. Reisner called it a, the South Palace, but it's clearly not a residential structure. And then uh, looking at the pottery and other material, it, it clearly... The site dates to the very end of the Second Intermediate Period and beginning of the 18th Dynasty, so the time when the Thebans were surrounded by the uh, Hyksos. And so we have typical pottery and uh, weapons from, the, from this period. And there was actually a lintel of Second Enre, who's, uh, who didn't fare very well in his battle against the Hyksos. You can see his mummy here, and he'd actually been killed uh, by a Hyksos battle axe. They actually were able to match the scar with a, a typical axe of the period. And he actually seems to have been laid on the battlefield. They discovered that his body seems to have been pecked by vultures, and so they were able to eventually rescue it, and he wound up in the cache of royal mummies at Dero Bakri. But so what had happened uh, in his reign is that uh, the Theban area, the traditional area of Egypt, was uh, circumscribed in this tiny little area just here, reaching just t to the Canna Bend. Uh, and so they were being attacked both from the south by the Kerma Nubians from Kush and then by the Hyksos in the north. So Daryl Balas seems to have been the kind of forward capital for the Theban kings. So a grand show of power and uh, might in order to impress the locals and as well as to sort of marshal the troops for the final eventual assault uh, in the delta. And so the palace was probably like we know from later palaces, uh, had these kind of uh, crenellated, it almost looks like a castle. And in fact, that's uh, not a coincidence. This kind of architecture really evolved in Egypt and is then brought by the Moors to Spain and then to Europe. So, so the kind of the antecedents of medieval castles really are uh, here in the ancient Near East. Uh, and we have, in the Nubian forts, we certainly have 
moats and keeps and drawbridges and arrow slits, all the kinds of things you associate with uh, medieval castles in England and Europe. Uh, and then around the elevated second story were a lot of columned calls and courts. These are some of the column bases still in situ. And here you can see the, uh, the plan of the center part of the palace. So again, it was raised up on these what are called casemates. And so these are uh, just cells filled with brickwork, and then they're filled in with rubble to, to form a kind of elevated second story. And so this is probably where the the throne room and the, the most important parts of the palace were, and then it was surrounded by uh, columned halls and courts um, that you see in, in other palaces uh, later on. The locals think this was an ancient jail, that these were cells for, for prisoners. So here's a, a look at the from the palace southward, and this is this uh, hill that that large structure was on. Here's where the workmen's village was and the chapels. And this gives you an idea of, of uh, how poorly preserved a lot of the houses were, just a kind of a few levels of brickwork. But this is a big problem because in the past, earlier excavators had excavated these mud brick structures and then just left them. And then they, they were very fragile and they just deteriorate. And this is the South Palace here. Uh, and you can see there was a uh, it's reached by a, a long staircase going up to the top of the, uh, this hill. And it looks like they actually um, took a natural hill and just encased it in brickwork in order to form this kind of elevated tower that you see here. And here you can see a plan of it. So we have, and it looks, this sort of looks like whipped cream, but this is actually, so again, the remains of kind of the, the upper part of the, the mountain. So uh, they've just sort of built it into the, the mountain itself. And more, of course, the, this casemate kind of foundations. Uh, and then from the top of it, you get uh, a great view of the Nile and the surrounding countryside. So clearly it was uh, an uh, important kind of military uh, outpost. And you could actually kind of see the ships and stuff sailing in the Nile. And what was interesting is that when I worked in Boston, I found a bunch of ostraca that were unlabeled, that were kind of lost in the basement. They lost their tags, so nobody knew what they were. But looking at the sherds, they looked clearly like they would be from Daryl Blas. And the philologist there said, oh, that's ridiculous. How can you tell from sherds where, <laughs> where an ostraca comes from? Uh, but fortunately, Barry Kemp sent me, uh, just uh, shortly thereafter, some photographs from Green's archive, and in it were photographs of these ostraca. And they were translated by Stephen Quirk, and they turn out to be uh, logs of ship's crews and rations for soldiers. So again, sort of confirming that this was kind of the marshalling place for the, the beginning of the wars against the Hyksos. And uh, eventually, of course, they do go up and uh, are able to destroy the Hyksos. It's interesting, again, it kind of confirms the use of the site because it's then abandoned in the reign of Ahmosa. We have uh, ceilings, we have uh, on the kind of refuse level of the destruction of the palace are, are some clay ceilings of Ahmosa. So we know that uh, it must have been abandoned then. And what was also interesting is that there are little votives that were deposited in the palace and little model clay ships again, as well as model weapons, including the earliest um, Chepesh sword, uh, a little clay model of that. And so here's Ahmosa. So, uh, and what's interesting is that Ahmosa, after defeating the Hyksos, builds a palace at Esbet Helmi in the Delta, recently found by Manfred Bitak. Uh, and it, it very much copies the design of Daryl Blas. Again, you have the two structures, this... Uh, smaller one that's kind of like the South Palace, an elevated uh, watchtower, and then the actual palace here, again, with, uh, with a raised casemate uh, section and then uh, courts below. So again, kind of showing how, how similar these sites are, how that they're really using kind of uh, deliberate patterning in, in both building domestic buildings and laying out sites in these royal cities. And here's a, a reconstruction of kind of what that uh, southern palace would have looked like uh, with, uh, again, these kind of crindolated battlements and even kind of towers.
So that was uh, one of the points here. That uh, this is a cartoon that says uh, about Amarna saying uh, it's unusual, but it's you <laughs> to Ignatin. But uh, but clearly the the my point that I take away from all of this is that Amarna wasn't all that unusual. It was unusual in its size and the design of its temples. But the idea of founding uh, what we call a royal city, a city for various royal purposes, be it a campaign palace like Daryl Balas, a Hebset palace like uh, Malkata, or Natan's uh, Amarna, um, there's certainly a long tradition of these in, in New Kingdom Egypt and perhaps even earlier. Um, and again, here just to show you again, uh, all these elements that we find uh, at Amarna and also many of them at Malkata, again, with, uh, with a sort, sort of main palace in the center and then uh, other structures uh, around them. Here's an air view of the site from the RAF in the 1930s, and you can just barely make out uh, the palace here uh, and then the little village that was on either side of it. But unfortunately now, the village has grown tremendously uh, and uh, is now threatening to destroy the site. Here you can see what uh, the palace looked like when I worked there in the 1980s. And here it is today with an apartment block built right next to it. So uh, it's really kind of frightening what's happening. Uh, it's also part of it's been turned into a soccer field. That's the least invasive of the, of the things. Uh, and then the South Palace, the, the staircase has been uh, undermined by looters, and a lot of it has collapsed here. And this is a danger that's facing a lot of these sites uh, in Egypt today. You hear a lot about looting, but actually it's, uh, it's even more worrisome, the kind of dis wholesale destruction that's happening uh, at these archaeological sites all, all up and down the Nile, particularly in the Nile Valley. So that's why I started this new fund to try to protect some of these sites, and hopefully Derablas in particular, and keep them from being completely uh, wiped off the map. So uh, I'll keep you posted on, on my future progress. So, thanks. Is there any questions? Yeah. What can your fund do in the case of what we've just seen? How can you protect for, against further incursions uh -huh. and, and what other sites? And what can you do? How do you do post guards? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, I think some of it is uh, uh, sort of the local antiquities uh, officials want to build some walls there. We were very successful at Malkata because uh, before the revolution, the antiquity service built a big wall around the site, and that's really worked very well to protect it. So, and in, in a number of other cases, they built these walls. It was a bit controversial because people said, oh, you're walling off the, but the sites that were walled have really been protected, and the ones without them have not. So, so in part, we'll try to do that, maybe even part kind of restoring them. Uh, another big important thing is that if, if these sites are restored and, and made uh, valuable for tourism, then it, they have some value to the community and they, they'll, they'll be easier for the antiquity service to help preserve them and not have the land taken away or the sites destroyed. So, so it's sort of, there are a whole um, number of options to, to try to preserve these, but it really, it really needs to become a, a focus in, in Egyptology because this is, and it's happening not just here, but at Amarna and other places. Uh, it's really frightening the kind of pace of, you know, the population in Egypt is just skyrocketing and, and the competition for this land is, is really fierce. So um, unless we really work hard to try to preserve these sites, um, they'll be gone. The familiar image from William Stevens and Smith are those line drawings of mural fragments yeah. of soldiers, axe, holding axes yeah, yeah. and so on. What are the fragments? Do we know? They're gone. They, they didn't even take a photograph. <laughs> they were pretty summary. There's just a sketch in the notebooks. So but, those uh, drawings that we have in, in art architecture, ancient Egypt, are yeah. That's it. That's it. And where were they? I did find a little piece of yellow, yellow yeah. ground. So, so uh, they, they were go? in. Um, they were in the entrance corridor. So as you went in, almost like in the Syrian palace, you know, you'd be, you know, assaulted with the. Uh, 
with the military, right, from the battle. So again, it's sort of restoring <coughs> that. So yeah, it's a shame there was, um, there also, they did, in Berkeley, they do have a bunch of faience tiles which decorated the palace. And that's kind of interesting too because the, the tiles are very much like the, the kind of Kerma tiles. And of course, the, the, what's interesting is we talked about that casemate architecture and it becomes a feature in later Egyptian architecture. But it appears all of a sudden here at Daryl Blas, but we can kind of see it evolving in the funerary tumuli at Karma, so I wonder if it's not, you know, we see that there's a lot of Nubian influence that, that people don't really see in New Kingdom Egypt. You know, we, we're well aware of the Near Eastern influence, but I think there's also a lot of uh, Nubian influence as well. Yes? It's really exciting to see you building up this whole site from what it looks like today. Yes. That's <laughs> because you've done, you've done your homework and yeah. visited the the collections and things like that. And it's very, very important, of course, for sites that look like this. Yes, yeah. And that are being encroached upon, that you do something with them. Yeah. Otherwise, the, uh, the, the local people and so forth will say, it doesn't matter. Exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. nothing here. Yeah, yeah. exactly. No, and that's a big, it's a big problem with all these sites. So, so. we were very fortunate on Malkata to have the help of the Antiquities Service. But again, it's, it's really, we need to to work on these and make them economically viable. They're not going to, you know, if we just leave them as ruins, they're, they're going to be gone, so. Well, yeah. Could I ask what uh, would make them economically viable? Well, again, uh, making them open for tourists. So making them, you know, if tourists come, if tourists buy tickets, if tourists come to see these things, then that creates jobs for the community. Even restoring them, as, as we know from Malkata that provides jobs and work as well. So, so you think there's enough there in that particular site to, to make it uh, viable? This site, um, yeah, I hope so because it's it's kind of on the road. It's on it's between Denver, which is a very visited site, and and Luxor, which is of course tourist central. So, um, so I think it, it does have that potential. It's, it, it, they're very impressive palaces, and also it, it it's kind of an opportunity. It's It'll be a good test to see because we'll need to involve the local community because they're in <laughs> meeting amongst it. So, uh, so it'll be a, a sort of test to see for other sites because there are a lot of other sites, Antonopolis, a lot of other sites that are kind of in this same um, same quandary where where you have a, you have an ancient site but you have population there as well. And how do you and Amarna, of course, and how do you parse that? How do you make it? make it necessary that the, the locals understand and want to preserve the sites. Um, uh, keep them for the future. I mean, we have the same kind of problem in Albany. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's not just Egypt. <laughs> Thank you very much. So. Yeah, that's